Well, I want to thank everybody for being with us here today. Uh, obviously, it has been a week since I last provided you a briefing, and candidly, a whole lot has happened in this past week. Uh, since we last met, uh, I've either been on the road or, or working on some of these strategies that I'll be talking about here shortly. I say that as a setup for this point, and that is be prepared for a large download of a lot of different information covering a lot of different segments. Uh, and so that's just the way that it's going to work uh, because so much happens in the course of a week. You might think, well, now that the storm is over, now that the waters are receding, uh, now that there may be no more potential loss of life, that would mean there would be less to report. The fact of the matter is it, it is good news uh, that the, the, uh, the risk to lives has now been reduced and not completely eliminated. But the amount of work that must be done as we begin the process of rebuilding uh, all of the affected regions is going to lead to a tremendous amount of information uh, to share with you on an ongoing basis. First, I want to give you some update, uh, some update information that was provided by uh, different reports that are just received. First, from, from the Red Cross, there are still 28 shelters uh, that remain open uh, for overnight stays uh, that house uh, more than 5,250 people. Uh, there remain 38 open points of distribution, uh, and that would be uh, for uh, the distribution of food, water, and other necessities. Uh, they include largely the, the Port Aransas, Aransas Pass, Jefferson, and Orange County areas. One of the largest tasks that we are dealing with right now uh, that we urge our local officials to be uh, swiftly and, and heavily engaged in is the process of debris removal. It is going fast, uh, but candidly not fast enough. Uh, we have identified additional crews that can assist local officials to expedite the debris removal process. We are working with FEMA as well as our uh, federal partners, uh, and they're giving, giving us greater flexibility uh, to help locals hire uh, companies and entities that can assist them in the debris removal process. As it concerns debris removal, there is an estimate uh, that there will be roughly 200 million cubic yards of debris uh, that will be removed. Uh, to put that in some level of context, that would fill up Cal Field about 125 times. Report from the Texas Department of Transportation. There are two roads that remain closed for flooding. There are 11 roads that remain closed because of damage. Uh, there are no interstates uh, that are closed, and the report is that all of the interstates have been inspected, uh, and at this time, uh, there is no perceived damage to interstate highways. Uh, one of the most uh, highly trafficked roads that remains closed is Highway 6 in Houston, and it may be closed for another four to five days. A report from TCEQ is that there are 130 debris removal sites uh, that are now approved and active. We are working on educating local officials on the need uh, to open these and, and more, and very importantly, uh, to get these debris removal sites approved to make sure that they get reimbursed. And let me issue this cautionary note now that needs to be issued every time we talk. And that is, as, as local officials 
uh, begin to undertake this process of uh, clearing the area up and begin the rebuilding process, uh, it's important to make sure that you get swift approval uh, so that you're not undertaking costs that may not get reimbursed. The TCEQ is, is working with the EPA to address environmental issues with regard to debris removal. On uh, power, there still remain uh, about 3,900 uh, homes and facilities without power. An important note is uh, that number will only decrease a little bit in the short term. The reason why is that there will remain hundreds of homes that will be unable to get a meter for access to power because those homes no longer exist. Uh, and may not be rebuilt anytime soon. On uh, water, uh, access to water uh, has continued to improve. That said, there still remain 77 boil water notices across the state, 19 water system outages, and 31 waste water outages. Those are large numbers. Uh, but the, they are primarily in uh, low population locations. For the Department of Public Safety, uh, at the maximum uh, during the height of the storm, the Department of Public Safety had deployed about 2,000 DPS officers, rangers, and other uh, members uh, that fall under the DPS jurisdiction uh, to the affected regions. Uh, that number has now been reduced to about 800. Uh, the DPS response was lauded uh, very uh, profoundly by all local officials uh, that I talked to across the region for uh, their presence and for their help uh, in responding uh, to the hurricane. From the Texas National Guard, uh, they are in the process of consolidating manpower uh, and making sure that manpower will be uh, will, will remain uh, in regions that need their support. Uh, this concerns especially with regard to uh, the points of distribution of essential resources uh, as well as any other needs uh, by locals. Uh, that said, the, the Texas National Guard uh, is helping out uh, our friends in Florida as Florida has responded to and continues to respond to uh, Hurricane Irma. Four C-130s have been dispatched uh, from Texas to Florida to transport uh, food, water, and other supplies. And Texas National Guard sent a team of 48 members as well as vehicles to uh, assist in opening up the Key West airfield. From the Department of uh, State Health Services, 2.4 million acres uh, have been sprayed uh, with uh, a mosquito spray uh, to begin to address uh, the need to uh, abate uh, the mosquitoes uh, that have proliferated in the aftermath of the hurricane. And we are working with local officials uh, to make sure that every need and demand uh, concerning uh, mosquito spray is going to be met this can be done at the local level, whether it be done by backpack or by truck. It can be done at local or state level by plane and continues to be done at the federal level uh, through C-130s uh, that are uh, providing that type of spray. We remain vigilant and aggressive in ensuring that vaccines uh, are getting to the front lines as needed, and that's especially true for the tetanus vaccine. It's very important for the public to know and understand uh, as they go through the process of going into areas that were impacted either by the hurricane wind or the flood waters, uh, that uh, as they reach in and, and, and stick their hands and bodies into uh, areas that have been affected and begin to break down and clean up and rebuild, uh, they could be uh, subjecting themselves to 
uh, cuts, scrapes, etc., uh, that could lead to uh, the type of infection that they would need a tetanus shot. So if you're not up to date on, on your tetanus shot, please get up to date. Uh, know that the resources to provide that uh, will be available. A few other things. One thing that happened since we last met, of course, is uh, uh, after announcing uh, the governor's commission to rebuild Texas, uh, Commissioner Sharp and I traveled uh, across the entire affected region from uh, the Corpus Christi uh, Rockport area through uh, Victoria, through Fort Bend County, through Houston, all the way to Beaumont uh, for three days, uh, talking to local leaders about uh, what exactly the commission is going to be able to do, how we can address their needs and challenges. And we had lengthy meetings with all of the elected officials uh, that we are going to be in contact with. Chancellor Sharp, Commissioner Sharp will go over more of that here in a second, but our primary goal is this, and that is to establish an effective line of communication so that we can swiftly address the unique needs at each local area. That means that every county judge, every mayor, uh, every elected official, whether it be a state representative or state senator, has their own personal contact customer service agent. Someone who they will have their name and their cell phone they can talk they can contact 24-7 uh, to plug right into uh, the commission that is being headed up by uh, Commissioner Sharp to make sure that whatever urgent need they have, that urgent need is going to be reported and addressed immediately. There have been a large number of efforts that have taken place over the past week as it addresses what I'll call financing issues uh, to help local officials be able to address their needs. The big one, of course, uh, that occurred uh, the day after we last met was that Congress passed a $15 billion hurricane package, uh, or let's, let's say a disaster relief package. And this is very important as it concerns funding for FEMA. It's also important as it concerns uh, a very meaningful $7.4 billion funding for community development block grants, also known as CDBGs. Uh, these types of grants provide 100% funding for a wide range of flexible uh, uh, needs that our communities have uh, that they will be able to quickly address. We've already had identified in the state of Texas far more than $7.4 billion in community development, community development block grant needs. And we are urging all local officials, whether you be mayors, <coughs> county judges, or whomever, uh, to work with us, uh, work with uh, the land office, I'll explain more about it in a second, and work with Commissioner Sharp on drafting your needs for community development block grants because uh, you, you want to be able to tap into that $7.4 billion quickly, but also importantly is this. As it concerns financing from the federal government, uh, in every conversation I've had with every leader in Washington, D.C., whether it be from the president to cabinet members uh, to <coughs> members of his uh, White House staff uh, to leaders of Congress, they all are very clear that there will be multiple uh, supplemental budgets that will be passed uh, to pay uh, for rebuilding Texas as well as rebuilding other disaster areas. Uh, we may have another supplemental budget as soon as the end of this month. Uh, there is also expected to be a supplemental budget in the October-November timeframe, maybe another one by the end of the year. So th the purpose is to, to make sure that all local officials know and understand uh, that they begin the process of uh, coming up with all their needs and being able to reduce their needs uh, to tangible dollar amount 
of, of what they need in order to help them be able to rebuild. Uh, also on, on the financing <coughs> side, we have worked very collaboratively uh, with FEMA. And once again, I applaud FEMA for showing both its flexibility as well as its innovation in coming up with new programs. One is to advance funding for debris removal. Again, understanding that in the early stages of recovery, one of the top issues is removing that debris. And as a demonstration of how this process works, uh, FEMA uh, working with us and, and also working with locals, we were able to provide to the city of Houston last Friday a check for more than $91 million, uh, as well as a check to Harris County for more than $44 million uh, as advanced payment uh, for their debris removal uh, process. Uh, that is a demonstration to all other uh, local entities across the state of Texas that we are there to, to assist you to get quick reimbursement or advance payment uh, when appropriate uh, for your needs as you begin the rebuilding process. Uh, very importantly, uh, something that needs to be emphasized is that uh, uh, my request for community disaster loan assistance from FEMA was approved. What this does is it uh, for, for local governments, uh, they can apply for funds to maintain their operating budget and function normally while helping their communities recover. This applies to local governments that have suffered a substantial loss of tax and other revenue because of a disaster. They can get uh, up to 25% of their operating budget for the fiscal year uh, through this program. This is just one of uh, a multitude of programs that we are working to make available to make sure that uh, at the local level, they are going to be able to maintain their operations while also addressing the needs uh, of dealing with the disaster. Another example along these lines is uh, the Texas Workforce Commission received a $30 million grant from the U.S. Department of Labor for National Dislocated Worker Grant. Uh, it's to create temporary jobs for displaced workers to assist in the cleanup recovery and humanitarian efforts in areas impacted by Hurricane Harvey. I'm going to, at various times, plug in uh, some of our other officials uh, who run different agencies here to talk about how part of this process works. At this time, uh, I want to have Chief Mim Kidd come up and, and talk about uh, what the model is going to look like for what's called public assistance. Uh, this is one of the ways in which the state of Texas uh, has worked with FEMA to come up with new, innovative, and, and expedited approach to help local officials find ways that they're going to be able, be able to better access financing and rebuild quicker. So this time, Chief Mim Kidd. So I know this is kind of small and we'll make copies of these and pass them around, but this is FEMA's new public assistance delivery model. It's the first time we will use this model in Texas. The goal is twofold. One is to speed up the identification of damage and getting that damage captured. And two is putting it into a format that FEMA can help standardize so that all of our local elected officials are working from the same standards and criteria. What we see a lot uh, where we have disagreements in past is the amount of insurance that's available. Because it's important to remember that insurance pays first and then FEMA pays second. And so working with our federal partners here in the Joint Field Office as well as in Region 6 up in Denton and as well as headquarters, the goal is to start doing applicant briefings virtually by webinar. The first of those has already taken place. In the past, the FEMA team and the TDEM team would drive around county to county, driving down county roads, looking and verifying with, with all of our own eyes the damages. This process is going to allow us to use technology better and smarter <coughs> to speed up this process in hopes that we can rebuild Texas even faster and better than before. Thank you, Chief. Uh, now to a, another category of, of a pressing issue, and that is housing. Uh, FEMA is working with Texas uh, and to help move Texans from evacuation centers to return to their homes uh, or to short-term living facilities and, and eventually to permanent housing. Uh, 
FEMA is, is working with Texas on several programs. Uh, one is known as the STEP program, which will be available to any local government that wants to use it. The program helps families live, that live in or uh, live nearby their home while they are in the process of repairing it. Uh, FEMA is also working with Texas on some other innovative approaches that will help Texans uh, keep stay in their homes uh, while repairs are being made. One is called direct repair, and I'm going to let uh, the uh, regional FEMA administrator, Tony Robinson, explain more about this, uh, as well as other housing options. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we're spending so much time together that he's becoming an expert on our FEMA program, so he does quite a good job of briefing them. Let me just give you a couple of uh, statistics to start off with. Our total registrations for FEMA assistance are over 735,000. Uh, We've funded over 378 million in direct payments to individuals who've applied for assistance. I, I have to mention two partners. Our Small Business Administration Partners has paid out over 172 million in low interest loans to roughly 2,000 homeowners and 154 businesses. Over the last 24 hours, they've processed over 28 million in loans in the last 24 hours, so over a million dollars an hour in loans. More than 21,000 households are staying in 2,000 hotels in 33 states under our transitional assistance program. The National Flood Insurance has had 84,000 claims in advance payments, so we're advancing that money over $204 million. I want to mention our volunteer ag agency partners. We have 93 volunteer organizations that are meeting requests for crisis cleanup. They've received over 12,000 requests for assistance, and they've already completed over 5,000 of those requests. As the governor mentioned, we are really looking at uh, innovative solutions in housing with the primary goal of getting individuals back to their homes as quickly and safely as possible. We were working with our state agency partners to develop plans with the local government that best meets the local needs to get into housing. So one of those initiatives is a, is a direct repair program be the first time we've delivered that where we can provide financial assistance to locals to do direct repairs on those homes and we'll continue to work on other innovative programs. Thank you. Thank you. More on housing. Uh, I want to uh, explain to you uh, a, a, a continuing role as well as an expanded role uh, that will be played by Commissioner uh, George P. Bush as well as the General Land Office. Uh, the General Land Office under Commissioner Bush will be responsible for administering the Community Devel uh, Development Block Grant Program with HUD and will oversee short-term and long-term housing recovery efforts. Now, uh, this makes sense in a couple of regards. The GLO has already been administering uh, the uh, CDBG uh, program and has received high marks for that. Uh, as one example, as I traveled around the state of Texas this past week, uh, I heard from people like the county judge of Jefferson County saying, listen, uh, the land office has been doing a terrific job uh, in administering this program. They hope that it would continue that way. Uh, and so that process will continue. Uh, we were advised this morning uh, by uh, the land office that they expect to need more than 50, that's five zero billion dollars uh, of funding to the Community Development Block Grant Program for housing, for long-term housing, and for infrastructure hardening. And that funding will help families get back uh, into housing uh, even quicker. In addition, uh, the General Land Office will be involved uh, in this uh, both short-term and long-term housing re recovery effort. And it makes sense because uh, housing in Texas is a natural fit for the GLO, which specializes in disaster recovery. More will be announced uh, about uh, these duties uh, next week uh, as we explain more about where we're going. Uh, importantly, the, the GLO work is separate from the Governor's Commission to Rebuild Texas. There may be some overlay in some areas, but for the most part the two are separate. You're going to hear a lot about this as we go forward as you learn nomenclature, but 
there is uh, what's called individual assistance, there's what's called public assistance. And for the most part, what's categorized as public assistance, which is the, the building out of all the infrastructure, whether it be uh, courthouses in Refugio, uh big roads and bridges projects, or uh, rebuilding schools that have been mowed down, those are all what are categorized as public assistance programs. Those are the types of programs uh, that Commissioner Sharp and the Commission to Rebuild Texas will be involved in. More about that later. We'll, we'll plug in Commissioner Sharp in a second. Before we do so, however, I, I know that there are a lot of people who have uh, a desire for information about what is going on about our schools and education. As a result, I would like uh, Commissioner Mike Morath to say a few words. And he may have been planning on doing this, but did you just share that contact information uh, both on cell phone and by email, I mean by internet, but you're happy to do that. Um, yeah, thank you, Governor. We, I am happy to report um, that due to the Herculean efforts of uh, local district leadership, local school leadership all over the state, um, the overwhelming majority of schools are actually back open today in Texas. Um, there is a small uh, uh, tranche of schools that will start on Monday, and then there are um, a number of schools um, that have unfortunately been more significantly damaged and will be closed for a significant length of time. To put that in perspective, we have reports of 52 campuses in the affected region from Corpus all the way to the Louisiana uh, border. 52 campuses that have suffered catastrophic damage, um, 234 additional campuses that have suffered significant uh, damage, and 678 campuses that have suffered some form of damage above and uh, beyond those numbers. Um, for many parents, uh, because what we would like to do is try to restore families uh, to a sense of normalcy as quickly as possible to ensure their kiddos are getting the, the education that they, that they deserve in our great schools in Texas. For many parents um, who are in districts that have been significantly affected, um, they are, they're still trying to make decisions as to where to enroll their children. As a result, we have set up a hotline and a, a series of resources on our webpage uh, to answer parent questions um, from any, anywhere in the Harvey affected region. Um, I, I would like to share with you that phone number because uh, the more parents that can be aware of this, the, the better. The phone number is 512-463-9603. Again, that's 512-463-9603. And you can also visit our website, tea.texas.gov, um, for resources related to Harvey. Um, we also have created similar resources to support school districts that are um, moving uh, aggressively uh, to um, repair and remediate their facilities and restore a sense of normalcy um, to get the top quality education to our kids um, as quickly as possible. <coughs> there are obviously many other issues associated with public education um, that are coming in. Our first priority, though, is, is restoring families uh, so that they have a safe place to get back to school. Over the course of the year, we'll be um, uh, analyzing every issue associated with Harvey, uh, very similar to how we responded um, from the Ike and, and Rita hurricane, including how to properly support the campuses, and in fact, the most significantly campus affected campuses on issues ranging from additional counseling services um, to safe testing and accountability. Very good, thank you. Well, I'm very grateful to Commissioner Sharp for taking on the job of helping to rebuild Texas. Uh, as I anticipated, uh, he has dived into this uh, with a tremendous amount of energy and innovation. And it has been typical for me to receive either phone calls, text, or emails from him uh, up to or sometimes well after midnight uh, on a daily basis about projects that he's working on, uh, about advancements that he's made, about questions that he has. Uh, but he, he's been heavily involved in going to communities, uh, talking directly to local leaders, hearing back from them, as well as setting up an infrastructure to be able to address the needs of our local communities and to expedite the rebuilding process. At uh, this time, I'd like Commissioner Sharp to provide an update on where things are and where things are going. Thank you, Governor. Well, that's because I still use a BlackBerry, and sometimes it doesn't work till midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, first of all, I want to say what an unbelievable team the governor with the federal government has put together back here. I have uh, commandeered some folks from Sandy. I've commandeered some folks from Katrina and others. And in their first couple of meetings, they pulled me aside and said, we've never seen people 
so responsive and so dedicated to this. And that includes the federal people and everybody else back here. It, it's really, uh, it, it makes the job pretty easy to have folks like this that, that uh, are working on this program. And you will see some things happen in Texas, a few of them the, the governor has mentioned, uh, that have never been done before in disasters that make good common sense that the governor, when necessary, will simply suspend rules and regulations to, to allow those kinds of things that happen. The innovation coming out of FEMA and the innovation coming from Chief Kidd and others uh, is really, I think, uh, going to be a model for a, for a lot of disasters to, to look at in the future. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, in some of the other disasters, uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, were spent uh, in setting up uh, consultants, people that could get information from local governments and things and move it back into the headquarters, whether that headquarters is in New Orleans or New York or wherever. In Texas, we were fortunate that we already have that organization set up. It's called the Agriculture Extension Service at, at A&M. Uh, those folks uh, do a lot less ag now and a whole lot more uh, public relations or e extension work with had it having to do with Hurricane H Harvey. As the governor mentioned, every county judge and every mayor in the affected area and every legislator uh, has someone that they uh, can call, tell them what their problems are, and they immediately call uh, a room in, headed by Billy Hamilton in College Station. They get a hold of these folks, and the response is generally very incredible. We get from those folks somewhere between 30 and 50 problems, requests for assistance, and things like that a day. Uh, in the last, uh, say, fi it takes five days to get through uh, all of them, but they keep coming every single day. Some may be questions. Um, but our goal is to make sure that the, the folks on the ground, uh, because that's where the decisions uh, are going to be made. It's not going to be dictated so much uh, from us or from the federal government. It's going to be what, what best fits. Houston devises its own housing plan. Uh, FEMA signs off on it and, and things like that. And so those ex that extension service, we, we have about uh, close to 300 personnel that do nothing but make sure that county judge, that mayor is getting them and those elected representatives get them information. Plus they all have my cell phone, they all have my uh, private email and, 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 and things like that to get it. Some of the examples uh, may be a wastewater system went out somewhere, they would call, uh, we would get University of Texas Engineering or A&M Engineering researchers to find a piece that they, they that's, that's missing, uh, go to a uh, supplier, get it for them that maybe they haven't bought that piece in 20 years or so. Uh, TxDOT highways are washed out. TxDOT uh, immediately uh, gets on those things. All the contracts that I know of are issued uh, for, for contract repair in that regard. Uh, we patch them in to de debris removal. There's lots of questions on that. Uh, some rules that the governor has already suspended about how to uh, how to get rid of uh, debris, rem debris instead of filling up land si uh, uh, landfills. Uh, mosquitoes was, was a question uh, last weekend. Uh, among other things, there were four C-130 gunships, minus the guns, uh, that flew over uh, the coastal areas um, last weekend and can will do so again very soon to, to get rid of mosquitoes. Most Texans didn't see those things. Uh, and no to the lady that said the reason you flew them at night was because there's so many guns in Texas. No, that was not the reason we flew them at night. Uh, but but uh, there were, uh, I'm sure, a lot less mosquitoes in Port Arthur and different places at the end of the result of that. But that came from, from mayors and county judges and says we got a real, real serious problem. Uh, we are already working with them for them to identify uh, for Commissioner Bush, uh, their top priority for community development block grants, that's in the process. One of the most important parts of all of this is the paperwork. I mean, where you really get in trouble, where <coughs> local governments get in trouble if they don't have this paperwork right, and then all of a sudden five years from now, you've got federal government clawing back money from them, and it's because some previous mayor or some previous judge did, didn't fill out the paperwork right, and so we're doing a lot of uh, help with regard to that. 
Uh, we've identified, a, we've developed a new software that's never been used before uh, that will show every single question that we get <coughs> in real time when the problem is solved, uh, who solved it, and all of these folks will have it. It, it. it is so good, actually, that it's already in Florida. They're using it for Irma uh, right now and, and, and using some of, the, some of the systems that we have. Governor announced yesterday the Rebuild, uh, Rebuild Texas dot today uh, website. They asked us why we said re put today on it. Said because that's the first word he used when I asked him when you want this done, and he said today. Uh, next Monday, uh, next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, lots of this team are going to be again in all those affected counties. Uh, it will be. Uh, two-hour work sessions with the judges, with the legislators, with the um, mayors, face-to-face, uh, -face, answer any questions, solve any problems that they have uh, with uh, folks from the land office about community development block, block grants and how, how those work and things like that. And so we'll be there Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. In addition to that, NIM, Chief Kidd, and some others are having separate meetings with folks, and the, the governor has got uh, other duties on the co coast that he's going to as well uh, with folks that he, he'll announce uh, later on. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really good process, um, and I think it's working well because the people that make the decisions are the mayor of Houston, mayor of Rockport, the mayor of the, you know, the county judges in different places, and we simply try to act as an extension for them on behalf of the governor to get their problem solved and to get their communities uh, rebuilt. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, bottom line is that there is a need for speed to rebuild all of these communities, and we now have the infrastructure in place to get that job done. We'll be happy to take any questions. Transitional housing. Say again. For and, and Tony, come come up here. I'm going to have you follow up on what I say. But uh, is uh, when you say transitional housing, we need to make sure we're all working on the same terminology and things like that. But uh, for uh, short term and long term housing, uh, uh, Commissioner George P. Bush is going to be taking the lead on that, as I just announced today. And we will be providing more details and information on that next week. At this time, however, I want Tony Robinson. Uh, the FEMA administrator uh, to be able to maybe more specifically address uh, your question. Thank you, Governor. As I said earlier, we've got about 21,000 households in our transitional shelter and assistance program. That is where they are qualified to go and stay in a hotel, and that is uh, paid for by the federal government. In addition to that, we are looking at uh, we're providing rental assistance through direct payments, as I talked about earlier, so that if they can find a place to rent while they're working on their damaged dwelling, they can do that. And we're also pro providing some direct payments for repairs to their home. In addition to that, we're going to be working on a menu of options that may be direct repairs where we can work through the state, the local government. And what we want to do is, once again, safely and expediently as possible, get people back into their homes. And so give a, a range of options that will work by jurisdiction. So what works in Beaumont may not work in the city of Houston. And so we want to work with the general land office, Texas Division of Emergency Management, to look at that range of options to do that. Is your sense that there's enough hotels and apartments available in these kinds of facilities areas to accommodate all these people, to accommodate the needs of those people? So, so I think uh, a couple of things. It, it's going to take a, a myriad of programs from the community that's the block grants and talked about, uh, hotels, apartments, uh, being able to go in and lease some of those and do uh, quick repairs to get them back up online. It's going to take all these agencies working together as well as with our uh, local elected officials to be able to find the right solutions that work best for those communities. Do you know Katrina triggers this one? S so no, because uh, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what a, what a Katrina trailer is, but manufactured housing and, and recreational vehicles may be an option that a local government chooses to use, and we're not going to prohibit them from doing that, but we are going to work with local governments through our state agencies to find out what is the best solution that takes care of getting folks back into the affected areas so they can get their kids back to school, or they can go back to their jobs, and they can get back to their normal life. Yeah, let, let me follow up on, on Rudy, what he said. It, it, one of the structures that we're setting up is to provide 
local governments and local leaders as much flexibility uh, as they can have uh, to determine what these local uh, or short-term housing needs look like, whether it be uh, uh, FEMA-based uh, homes or whether it be having them uh, in other situations and whether they participate in the STEP program uh, or the direct repair program. Uh, I think it's very important to let local leaders uh, have a say in that process and that's one of our goals. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, the, on the lives lost, Understand this, and, and that is, it's it's still impossible at this stage to say precisely how many lives were lost as a direct cause uh, of the hurricane uh, or the storms. Uh, we have a report in that there are uh, 82 deaths, uh, but w the the confirmation of those about what the cause is comes from the local level, and so we are still waiting for uh, all of the local confirmations to come in. But uh, it, it's safe to say uh, definitely more than 70, probably more than 80. Understand this also, and, and that is while uh, the profound search and rescue process that you have observed over the past couple of weeks uh, <coughs> has been reduced, we are still making sure that we go home to home, to home until every home uh, is searched uh, before we can have any meaningful confirmation. So that process will continue uh, for the immediate short term. Do you have any I do not. So can you Governor. talk about the um, neighbors helping neighbors aspect and how that might be <coughs> future in traffic and responses, uh, particularly with water? Uh, maybe in a way, if you could be a, a tiny bit more specific. Well, I mean, yeah. a lot of the rescues were done by citizens <coughs> of the coast, whether from Texas or from Louisiana, and I'm curious about how those efforts will be um, like included in the state response and if, so that they can work together and help well, and you talk about going forward. Like, let, let's say, a, as we prepare for the next hurricane or next flood, uh, we obviously will, will we, we, for this one, we applied lessons learned from the past. Uh, for the next one, we will apply lessons learned from this one. But what the state can and must do uh, is to work on applying the resources that we have available to the state, uh, the resources available at the local level, as well as the resources av available at the, at the federal level. We, we, we work first to pre-position as, as many of those resources as possible and then be prepared to deploy as many as will be needed uh, based upon anticipated expectations. With regard to the, the private resources, uh, the, the state, as you might imagine, has no authority uh, to deploy private resources. Uh, that is something that uh, we see occur across America where Americans pitch in to help Americans uh, we see it very profoundly here in the state of Texas with Texans helping Texans, but it could be the Cajun Navy coming in. Uh, but it, it could be uh, 501c3 uh, organizations that participate. And, and that is something that we cannot pre-plan for. Uh, we do engage in conversations, especially with some of the nonprofit organizations in advance, and, and work with them in advance, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but Texans helping Texans, neighbors helping neighbors, strangers helping strangers. It's something that is very profound in the state of Texas, something we are very grateful for, and something that we will anticipate in the future. But as far as our, our strategic planning is concerned, we do not plug that into our, our strategic plan. Well, well, let's go back to the right mosquito here. spray. You were talking about during the Atlantic Coast line. And last year this time, we were dealing with a different crisis, uh, one caused by the mosquitoes, the Zika virus. And you set up a lot of testing centers and things like that throughout South Texas. Are those still operational? Talk about that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm John Hallerstadt. I'm the uh, commissioner for the Texas Department of State Health Services. Uh, our Zika um, surveillance has continued unabated, so uh, I won't go into a lot of details of that, but yes, that has not stopped. Most of the surveillance is, again, looking for the presence of the disease in, in human beings. In addition to that, we have the vector control piece of it, which was a part of what we were doing for Zika but is now a huge part of what we're doing in terms of the response to Hurricane uh, Harvey. And that has to do with the fact that m when you have this much water, you have a tremendous bloom of mosquito species, not all of whom are the kind that carry the Zika virus. In fact, most are not. But because they're there present in such vast numbers, 
their vast numbers actually inhibit people's ability to go back in and recover and repopulate. So that becomes a public health problem in itself. So the level of aerial spraying in particular that we have uh, tapped into and made happen as a result of Hurricane Harvey is a thousand times greater than what we had anticipated uh, for Zika simply because the, the needs are so very different. Yeah, what's your reaction to the people that are here? Uh, that, you know, I've never seen anything like this in all the hurricanes that I've studied. I've never seen a group of people in a building like this doing what they're doing. As you're walking around and you're talking to these people, are you kind of stepping back by uh, what's happening here right now? I'm awed by this, and, and I don't know how much of this you've seen. You can, you can see this here, but what you may not know is it, it covers pretty much the entire building. You can go down hallways that way, then break down further hallways. It goes down hallways that way. And, and so how many people are in here, ma'am? About 2,000. About 2,000 people are working in here right now, uh, day and night, uh, to help Texans recover from this disaster. This is incredibly impressive. Uh, I'm awestruck by how uh, effective they are and how compassionate they are working to help Texans rebuild. Thank you all very much.